Okay, in the last lecture, uh, I mentioned some peculiarities of martensite, including the fact that uh, the habit planes are not uh, rational planes, for example, closed back planes, uh, and that the orientation relationship is uh, also irrational. The shape deformation itself is an invariant plane strain when we measure it accurately. It seems to leave a plane completely unchanged, uh, undistorted and unrotated. So let us first of all see whether we can transform austenite into martensite by a deformation which leaves a plane completely unchanged and uh, um, undistorted and unrotated. So, these are the two crystal structures. We have got austenite gamma on the right and a ferrite on the left. And at first sight, you know, we do not see a clear relationship on how to deform the parent in order to get the product phase. But if I draw a couple of the austenite cells next to each other, uh, like so, and just color these particular atoms in red then you can see that we can represent austenite using a body centered tetragonal unit cell. Okay? So, if you remember from crystallography, uh, if you have a periodic pattern of points, you can represent it by an infinite number of unit cells, uh, but we tend to choose ones which give us 90 degrees or equal lattice parameters and so on, but there is nothing, uh, nothing special in representing austenite as a body centered tetragonal unit cell. Uh, but it immediately tells you how uh, to change that into body centered cubic. You know, if you compress it along the z axis and expand uniformly along the x and y axis, then you get your body centered uh, cubic cell here. And the deformations uh, are straightforward that in the vertical direction is basically the ratio of the lattice parameters, and in the horizontal direction the 1 0 0 of the cubic is equivalent to the a by 2 1 1 0 of the parent phase. So, the distortion is root 2 a alpha over a gamma. So, this is called the Bain strain and it tells you that we can put a simple deformation which is a pure deformation that means just compression along the principal axes uh, and expansion along the other two principal axes. It also tells you that there is an orientation relationship here between the austenite and ferrite that the 0, 0, 1 axes of the two cells should be aligned. Okay? That means the z axes are aligned and that the 1, 0, 0 direction of the ferrite is parallel to a 1, 1, 0 direction of the austenite and those are exact, okay? exact parallelisms. Uh, when you do the Bain strain, we retain parallelism between the O01 gamma and O01 alpha. And uh, because there is a uniform expansion in this plane, uh, this direction here is parallel to the 110 type direction of the austenite. <coughs> so, uh, basically, this is not the orientation relationship we observe. Yeah? Uh, what we see is that the closed back planes, the most densely packed planes are roughly parallel and the uh, close back directions within those planes are roughly parallel, whereas this is an exact orientation relationship. Okay? So, at the moment uh, we have not solved anything except there is a deformation which changes austenite into ferrite. And then the next question is, you know, does this deformation leave a plane completely unchanged as we observe in the shape deformation. Okay? When we measure the shape deformation, we see that it is an invariant plane strain. So, is that is this deformation consistent with that? Uh, now, supposing that I represent the austenite as a sphere. Okay? So, that is the yellow sphere and when I apply the Bain strain, it will change into something like a Maltese, uh, not a Maltese, uh, um, Maltese are spherical aren't they? Yeah. Honeycomb, Wh what is that other chocolate which is flat? Uh, sorry? Smarty. Smarty, yeah that is it, <laughs> yeah. So, um, it basically becomes like uh, an ellipsoid of rotation about the z axis. So, we have 
taken a section of uh, the austenite here. This is the z-axis and this is the x-axis. Compression along the z-axis leads to this ellipsoid and uh, expansion along here and compression along there. And of course the section containing 0, 0, 001 and 0, 010 0 will look identical to that, okay? Because we have uniform expansion in the basal plane. Now you can see that there are two lines originally in the austenite, uh, OA and OB, which are unchanged in length by the Bain strain. Okay? Now does that mean that we've found two lines which are invariant? Because they, they, they are rotated, right? So we do not have coherency there. Um, we don't have actually a single line which is unreto uh, undistorted and unrotated. However, if I take my ellipsoid and apply a rigid body rotation so that one of those uh, two sets of lines comes into coincidence, then I've recovered one coherent line. Okay? That's illustrated in the second direction where OA and OA dashed are exactly equal in length and pointing in the same direction. So if I combine the Bain strain with a rigid body rotation, that amounts to an invariant line strain. Okay? Invariant line strain means you've left one line unrotated and undistorted. Is everyone happy with that? So the shape change is an invariant plane strain, but there is no possibility of getting an invariant plane strain when we transform austenite into martensite you can only recover one line as being fully coherent. And you remember from the last lecture, that's the minimum condition for martensitic transmission, that there must be at least one line fully coherent in the interface between martensite and austenite. Okay, so um, when, uh, I forgot to mention that when we add the rigid body rotation to the Bain strain, we exactly predict the observed orientation relationship, okay? uh, the irrational orientation relationship, the amount of rigid body rotation needed to produce the invariant line precisely predicts the orientation relationship. So given lattice parameters, you can accurately predict the observed orientation relationship between austenite and ferrite because in the Bain strain, all you need is the lattice parameters to define how much deformation and then you work out the rotation needed to generate the invariant line. But we still have the shape deformation, which appears to leave a plane unchanged. Uh, and that's inconsistent with the combination of Bain strain and rigid body rotation. And we haven't explained the habit plane. So um, this, is a, this is a bit of revision. But if you pay attention to the screen, because it's all written down in your notes, uh, if I start with a, a crystal of austenite of this shape, okay, I can, I can start with any shape I like, then when we transform it into martensite, we see a shape deformation which leaves one plane uh, unchanged in length, uh, un unchanged in um, invariant plane. So the plane that is invariant here is which one? Yeah. Yes, uh, Wx, that's right. Uh, so this, this plane on which we observe the shape deformation remains unchanged and uh, unrotated. But we know that a shear cannot transform austenite into martensite. We proved that with that ellipsoid construction. Therefore, this must be the wrong crystal structure. Now, if I add another shear on a different plane, then what does the combination of two shears equal. Yeah. So these are two invariant plane strains on different planes. Invariant yeah. So at the intersection of those two planes, there's only one line which is common to those two planes. And therefore, a combination of two shears is equal to an invariant line strain. So if I now uh, shear this uh, object on the plane x, y, 
then I get uh, the martensite crystal structure, but it's the wrong shape because we don't observe this part of the deformation. Okay. Is that everyone clear so far? So we we can either get the right crystal structure or the right shape, but not both so far, right? Now, is it possible to correct the shape of this green object using deformations which do not change the crystal structure? Okay, so, tell me some deformations which do not change the crystal structure. Twinning. What else? Slip. Slip. Yeah. So, you know, if if your burgers vector is a lattice vector in slip, you don't change the crystal structure. And twinning uh, simply reorients the structure. So if I if I periodically slip or twin this to recover this shape macroscopically, okay. So that's a periodic twinning, and the macroscopic shape here is the same as this. And in slip, I wouldn't see the twin interfaces, uh, but you would see slip steps at the interface. Then I now have the right crystal structure and the right macroscopic shape. But if I look very carefully at the martensite, I will either see twinning, very fine periodic twinning inside the martensite plate, or I will see slip steps uh, if I look at with sufficient resolution in a transmission electron microscope. At the interface, I will see slip steps. Now, even though these planes here might be rational planes on which we get the deformation, the average plane from the twinned interface or the slipped interface could be anything depending on how much we have to correct the shape, right? And that is why the martensite appears to form on very strange habit planes because what we are picking up when we measure the habit planes is this average interface here and this average interface here. Now, all of these operations are mathematically expressed you know, the Bain strain, rigid body rotation, and the amount of deformation to correct the shape. Which means that from a knowledge of the lattice parameters, we can completely predict the crystallography of martensite. The habit plane, the orientation relationship, and the shape deformation, they're all mathematically linked. Okay? So that is the success of this theory of uh, martensite crystallography that every aspect of martensite insight can be predicted. Is everyone happy with that? So you could ask the question, you know, in what circumstances will the martensite insight show twins as opposed to slip? Any ideas? Sorry? Uh, different stacking fault energy. The stacking fault energy of uh, BCC is very high. You know, you do not ever, uh, unle unless you do very, very special experiments, see dislocations dissociated. Okay? Uh, but say I take an ordinary piece of material, and uh, in what circumstances should I see it slip, uh, or how could I induce it to deform by twinning? Hmm? Temperature difference and uh, an alternative to temperature strain rate. Yeah? So if you have something happening at a very high strain rate, then you tend to get twinning because uh, you know, twinning, can uh, twinning can induce deformation in a large region very quickly. Okay? So when the martensite growth rate is very high, you tend to see the twinning mode of lattice invariant deformation. And if the temperature is high or the movement of the interface is slow, then you tend to get deformation by slip. And you can even find martensite plates in which they start off very rapidly, but then there is recalescence. Do you know what recalescence means? The, yeah? Yeah, so, so you know, the heat of transformation can't be dissipated fast enough, and therefore it warms up the material. So the transformation itself warms up the material, so it switches from twinning to slip as the plate becomes fatter. Now, all this was uh, actually predicted before 
the micros microscopy techniques became available to look at twinning and slip the electron microscopy techniques. So, originally in, in material science uh, the electron microscopy was based on replicas you know that means you put deposit carbon on the surface you pull off that carbon layer and stick it into a TEM. So, effectively you see the etching relief ok. So, people could see the traces of the twins, but you cannot verify that they are twins unless you do transmission electron microscopy and do the electron diffraction which shows that they are twins. So, this was uh, this is a TEM image of a thin foil and you can see extremely finely spaced twins inside the plate of martensite ok. So, these are called transformation twins and they basically serve the purpose of giving you a macroscopically coherent interface an invariant plane ok. Everyone happy with that? If you if you do not have um, twins then you do not have interfaces inside your plate. So, it is a it is a relatively lower energy situation, but twins are favored if the strain rate is high or the transformation temperature is low. So, you know the predictions were actually made before you could uh, prove that uh, the twins etcetera the slip steps etcetera exist in the interface. Now, there is another kind of martensitic transformation which you are familiar with all right. Uh, you know that the stacking sequence of 1 1 1 planes in uh, cubic uh, close packed is a b c a b c a b c right. If I want to transform it into a hexagonal close packed structure then all I have to do is every second layer I put a slip uh, slip dislocation which does not have a uh, lattice vector as its Burgers vector. So, it will change the stacking sequence from a b c a b c to a b a b yeah. Do you know what that partial dislocation is called or its Burgers vector which will change a layer from an a to a b position instead of a to a yeah. Have you heard of Shockley partials Shockley partials yeah. So, there, there are dislocations whose uh, Burgers vector is a by 6 1 1 2. Look at the close back plane uh, of austenite the 1 1 1 plane then these are the c positions and the translation from a c position to a c position is a lattice vector a by 2 1 1 0 which we can decompose into two partials because here we are actually changing the stacking sequence because we are translating the next layer from a c position to a b position instead of from c to c. So, these are the two partials a by 6 2 1 1 and a by 6 1 2 bar 1 which add up to give us this lattice translation and the FCC to HCP transformation is achieved by passing this Shockley partial dislocation on every second close back layer. So, the shear strain is simply given by the displacement here uh, which is uh, the magnitude of the a by 6 2 1 1 vector divided by twice the spacing of the 1 1 1 plane. So, that comes to 1 over square root of 8. So, it, if you pass this Shockley partial on every second lattice plane then that transforms a b c a b c stacking of the 1 1 1 planes in austenite into the a b a b stacking of the basal planes of the HCP crystal. Now, what this means is that you can obtain hexagonal close back martensite by a deformation which is a shear that means an invariant plane strain. So, every line in that plane is an invariant line which satisfies the minimum condition for martensitic transformation and furthermore the story is complete. Uh, there is no additional deformation needed to correct the shape because the shear is the deformation which changes FCC to HCP. So, the story for the FCC to HCP transformation is much simpler than for FCC to BCC.
So, the diagram that we drew from FCC to BCC becomes incredibly simple. You know, a shear transforms FCC into HCP and that's the end of the story. We are left with a whole plane which is completely coherent, which is consistent with uh, the minimum requirement of uh, the theory of Martin's side that you must have one uh, coherent line. Well, we've got an infinite number of coherent lines in the coherent plane. So, there are no twins that you would see in this uh, Martin's side. You would not see those uh, slip steps associated with the correction of the overall shape and you would pick up the strain as a shear deformation. Yeah. Everyone happy with that? Martin's side is not HCP though. Yeah. Yeah. So, Martin's side can have any crystal structure. We are familiar with going from FCC to BCC or BCT, okay. but this is a transformation of austenite into hexagonal close back Martin's side. Okay. Yeah. So, there is no diffusion, it is just a shear. Uh, and you can even get transformation backwards from BCC to FCC Martin site. If you, if you heat up sufficiently rapidly, you can get a reverse transformation. Yeah. So, in that movie I showed in the last lecture of iron platinum, uh, you know, the, you saw the shape deformation appear and then disappear. Yeah. So, we are familiar with um, uh, martensitic transformations uh, in, in steels, but actually uh, there are many, many hundreds of martensitic transformations between different crystal structures, but they all follow this same basic theory and hexagonal close back martensite looks, uh, looks like this and uh, these days uh, you will see in a later lecture that there are some special steels where we add a huge amount of manganese, okay, something like 38 percent of manganese and that uh, actually has a huge amount of, uh, of this hexagonal closed back martensite which forms instead of the body centered cubic. I, I will go into that in more detail in a future lecture, but it is quite possible to get hexagonal closed back martensite even in austenitic stainless steel. Okay. <coughs> in pure iron, uh, we, we cannot get this except at extremely high pressures, you know, 130,000 atmospheres of pressure. Okay, so um, there is one caveat, all right, to this. Now, this is a shear deformation. I explained to you that in pure iron, I have to have a pressure of 130,000 atmospheres to get HCP. Now, if pressure favors HCP, what does that tell you about the density of HCP relative to FCC? Uh, that would mean a volume expansion. Ah, sorry. Yeah, the opposite, yeah. So, HCP is actually denser than FCC. This deformation does not tell you that, right? So, is this simply uh, a stacking fault or is it martensite? Because if it is martensite, we should get a volume change. Right? Now, there was a, uh, an absolutely brilliant experiment done in Birmingham University, um, where they demonstrated using transmission microscopy that you get a volume contraction as well as a shear. Okay. The volume contraction is normal to the fault plane. So, this is what a fault looks like in a transmission electron microscope. Uh, so, you have got Shockley partial which has moved and created a fault. So, instead of ABC, ABC stacking locally you have got AB, AB stacking. Okay. So, you can think of that as an HCP region, but only if there is also a volume change a reduction in volume. Okay. Now, the contrast that you see the fringes on this fault is because the fault lies at an angle to the thin foil right? and in fact, the intensity of the beam in a transmission electron microscope does uh, vary sinusoidally with depth. Right? Therefore, you know if you have an inclined plane, 
then you'll go from bright to dark to bright to dark fringes. Right? <coughs> However, if you choose to form an image uh, with a reciprocal lattice vector, okay, a dark field image, which lies at 90 degrees to your displacement, that means A by 6, 1, 1, 2. Yeah? So you choose, uh, let's say, 1, 1 bar 1, then the fault should disappear. Right? And if you look on the right, it has disappeared. The contrast has disappeared. That's the way we can find Burgers vectors and so on. But notice that the contrast hasn't completely disappeared. Okay? Can you see some light fringes? So, those are due to the volume change normal to the fold plane. And what they did was uh, they looked at three different alloys where the volume changes are um, different. Okay? Cobalt uh, iron alloys, where the volume change in going from FCC to SCP is different. And you can show that the contrast, the residual contrast that remains, increases as the volume change becomes larger. So, from this uh, really clever experiment, you can prove that actually this is mud inside, it's not just a stacking fault. Okay? So, this might be the first ever observation of the nucleus of <coughs> mud inside. Right? I mean, you don't really see nuclei because they tend to be very small, but this is not yet fully developed into a thick plate of mud inside. So, the nucleus is basically a Shockley partial creating a fault with a volume change normal to it. Okay? Everyone happy? Yep. But why do you get a volume change from FCC to HCP yeah, on yeah. a crystal crystallographic level? Yeah, that's a very good point. So we think of these as hard spheres, don't we? But the coordination is different between ABC and ABAB, the local coordination. And that means that the hard sphere model does not apply. Yeah? So even in BCC, if you think about the hard sphere model, it's not stable. Yeah, but it exists, you know, uh, because uh, the the ideas we use in a hard sphere model is that the forces are directed between atoms. Okay, that's not actually the case. Yeah. Okay. okay um, so let's assume that everything we know about crystallography can be predicted. What's, by the way, what's the habit plane of uh, HCP martensite? Exactly. Okay? No irrational nonsense, yeah? Because the shear generates the martensite. Okay, so everything is consistent, you know. Um, if you can find a lattice deformation which is a shear which changes the parent in the product, then everything has rational indices, including the orientation relationship. And what is the orientation relationship for FCC to HCP? Yeah, you've got the one 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 plane of Osnite parallel to Yeah, the basal plane of the HCP. And the one 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 direction uh, sorry, the one one zero direction in the one 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 plane is parallel to the closed back direction in the basal plane of HCP. Perfectly rational orientation relationship. Okay. So we can we can predict everything about martensite crystallography, even the thickness of the plate given uh, a grain size because we work out the strain energy and see how long it can get and how thick it can get. Uh, now we are going to look into predicting uh, at what temperature martensite should form. And uh, here we have the uh, free energy curves of ferrite and austenite as a function of the carbon concentration and the particular temperature T1. In order to find the equilibrium compositions of austenite and ferrite, are you familiar that we draw a common tangent to these two curves? Yeah? Okay. So, um, here is our common tangent and that gives me the equilibrium composition of ferrite at the temperature T1 here and the equilibrium composition of austenite at that temperature. And if I plot the locus of those points as a function of temperature, then I get my uh, 
AE1 and A3 phase boundaries on the iron carbon phase diagram, right? You familiar with that? Okay, so that's how we calculate phase diagrams. We have free energy data and we find equilibrium and that tells us the uh, phase boundaries. Uh, is everyone uh, happy with the common tangent construction and uh, you, you know, you understand where the common tangent construction comes from? Okay, if not, ask in supervision, all right? Um, okay, now there's one thing that you won't find on phase diagrams, all right? And if you look, uh, there is a point uh, over here where these two free energy curves intersect. That means ferrite and austenite of the same chemical composition has the same free energy. And if I plot the locus of those points, that gives me a, a line which we'll call the T0 line, where ferrite and austenite of the same composition have the same free energy. Now what that means is that if I take austenite of this composition and I transform it into ferrite of exactly the same composition, I can get a reduction in free energy if I'm to the left of the T0 curve. Yeah? Because look, austenite of this composition, if I drop it to ferrite of the same composition, I've got a reduction in free energy. But on this side of the curve, I get an increase in free energy. So thermodynamically impossible to get a diffusion-less transformation if the composition of the austenite is to the right of the T0 curve. Okay, so I cannot possibly form martensite if the composition of the austenite is to the right of the T0 curve. It's not thermodynamically possible. Okay? Everyone happy with that? Okay. Um, sorry. Now, if I, if I transform to an equilibrium mixture of phases, I will have a greater free energy change than if I transform without a composition change. But you know, if the transformation temperature is low enough, the system doesn't have a choice because diffusion is not possible and therefore you cannot achieve equilibrium. So in the first lecture, someone said martensite is metastable. That's correct. It doesn't lead to the lowest free energy change. It's only there because of kinetics. Okay. Now, I said that you cannot form martensite unless you are below the T0 curve, right? But there are additional terms that we need to account for. So the strain energy due to the shape deformation is very large. It's of the order of 600 joules per mole. And just to give you an idea, you know, you can form perlite at just 50 joules per mole, right? But here, the strain energy due to this massive deformation accompanying the crystal structure change it's very large and it's about 600 joules per mole. Then you have the twin interface energy, the uh, interface between the gamma and alpha prime, and you might generate dislocation debris because uh, of the large deformation. So if you add all that up, that comes to approximately 700 joules per mole. So we will need to undercool below T0 sufficiently to account for 700 joules before martensite forms. Okay. So, when I drew the free energy curve of alpha, I really need to draw the free energy curve of alpha prime, which is raised above alpha by that 700 joules per mole. Okay. So that instead of the T0 curve, we now have the T0 prime curve, uh, below which martensite can form, because we've got to account for this stored energy.
Yeah, so the difference here between this point and this point is your stored energy term. And you can see that the C0 point here has moved to a lower concentration here. In other words, the T0 curve is shifted towards the left to T0 prime. Okay, so uh, let's assume that we can calculate G alpha and G gamma to our heart's content, all right, as a function of any alloying additions you choose to add. So that actually is quite possible now. Yeah, we have huge thermodynamic data banks and the software to interpret those data banks. So if you tell me that, look, if I add uh, another 20 elements to iron, how will the martensite start temperature change? Well, you can calculate that because you plot the free energy of martensite as a function of temperature here and the free energy of austenite as a function of temperature where the cross is the T0 temperature and once we've accounted for the stored energy of transformation that gives us the martensite start temperature. <coughs> so we have to cool below T0 to account for the stored energy of transformation and that gives us the MS temperature. So if tomorrow you tell me, okay, if I add gold to iron, how will that change the martensite start temperature? You can do that calculation. Is everyone happy with that? Okay. So we'll come back to the T0 curve in the next lecture when we talk about bainite. It's really uh, very important. Uh, but the fact is that for martensite, I explained to you in the first lecture, it's actually a very simple transformation. There's no composition change. So we can calculate uh, crystallography, we can calculate uh, the effect of alloying elements, etc., on the martensite start temperature without any real difficulty. Okay? Even if you have 20 or 30 alloying elements in the material, we have the thermodynamics to be able to do that. Okay, so that is the end of today's lecture and frankly speaking, you know, in two lectures, right, We've understood everything about martensite and what you can do. Yeah? So that's really impressive. So I'll see you in the next lecture to discuss bainite, which is a little bit more complicated. <laughs> <laughs>